don't you even try. You are the one responsible. Look, you had it I'm from tired of it. No, I'm not having no. it. And I hate that stupid face on your face. Because you blew me up with your stupid toy. I've been pissing blood for weeks now, and I think I broke an orbital bone. So that actually hurt you. Huh. See, I wasn't sure if that was canonical or not. Well, me neither, if I'm being honest. Well, you crushed me with a wooden horsey, so I guess we're even. Then we're in agreement? We'll try to paddle in the same direction for this episode. No more trying to murder each other. What about insults? Well, I guess it's okay if there are a few insults. You look like homeless Vincent D'Onofrio if he had a scorching case of Bell's palsy. Do you want to... You could take a starring role as William Fatner in a Star Trek parody. Sorry, Barry. It's just so easy. Maybe it's better if you just get it out of your system. You can have one more. You look like a more cartoonish version of Judge Valkenheiser from that awful Dan Aykroyd movie. Ooh, Dan Snackroyd. See, I almost missed that one. But, 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 no, don't reference that one just yet. We're probably going to review it at some point. Anyway, today's movie breakdown is 2018's Hereditary, directed by Ari Aster, who also directed 2019's Midsummer. Whoa, Barry, have you thought this one through? I mean, you're way too dumb for a movie like Hereditary. You had trouble unpacking the plot of Demolition Man. Piss off, Fly. It's January. Everyone knows January's the best month for horror movies. And we've all had a chance to reflect on our various failures and inadequacies throughout 2023. And yet, death did not pay us his merciful visit. We trudge onward into 2024, knowing damn well that our lives won't get any better, but sort of pretending to pretend that they can. I'm being dead serious. I think that explosion gave you CTE and dropped you a good 30 IQ points. You used to be Joe Bluth dumb. Now you're Bert Kreischer dumb. Yeah, I can handle a simple ghost story. Asswipe. A lot of those other reviews of Hereditary go into excruciating detail about the mythos of the demon god Paimon and the exact species of camel he prefers for travel. We're not here to play Trivial Pursuit or hunt down every last Easter egg. This is going to be one of Barry's patented basic bitch breakdowns. If you're looking for a dissertation on payment, you can go pound sand. There are plenty of other YouTube channels for that kind of thing. Uh, maybe don't overstress that point, Barry. We need viewers like Steve-O needs to run another ad break. Also, this movie is six years old, so you bet we're giving spoilers. Now, let's talk directors. Ari Aster is one of the few cats out there today who writes and directs his own films. And in contrast to certain other well-known writer-directors, Ari doesn't jeopardize his own work by giving himself speaking parts. One of the tenants got murdered off-site and people are on edge. I just want to feel safe. Shut up, Black. You ain't got nothing to say I want to hear. Bro, we should review M. Night's Lady in the Water. Yeah, let's see if the viewers show any interest. For the most part, they've just been sending the usual death threats. So, one aspect of this film that does tend to get overlooked is the setting, Salt Lake City, Utah. You might consider this to be a throwaway detail if you spend all your viewing energy tracking down every last time payment scratches his ass. But Utah is actually an important backdrop for a spooky movie like Hereditary. This is an environment that's equal parts majestic and menacing. A rugged, unforgiving landscape that supports the Kantian sublime. In this place, you are small and fragile and anonymous. The landscape can swallow you whole, and all of it is inhabited by, uh, let's just say a rather eclectic group of white folk who all have perfect teeth and Barbie doll hair. Much like The Shining, this movie knows that it needs to open on a somewhat sinister note. So we start with the death of Grandma Graham. My mother was a very secretive and private woman. She had private rituals, private friends, private anxieties. During the service, we meet the members of the Graham family, an admittedly bland and standard clan. Gabriel Byrne plays the handsome but morose good guy father. Then we got Tony Collette as Annie, the obligatory white bread wine mom. Alex Wolf as Peter, the pothead fail son. And Millie Shapiro as young Charlie. Well, that was your opinion, and you were... Well, Barry, what exactly strikes you as bland or standard about this family? 
Well, for starters, the mom's frazzled in all the most predictable ways, and there's evidence that Grandma Graham made some dubious Craigslist friends before she died. Then you've got the daughter who makes that clicking noise, draws zany cartoons in her sketchbook, and constructs lots of avant-garde folk art. So Charlie doesn't strike you as kinda off-putting? Who among us doesn't have a sister who clicks her tongue during funerals, or likes to bite the head off the odd lizard? Aside from the weirdos at Grandma's funeral, one of the first signs that something's off is the fact that the Graham family's house is inhabited by strangers. Listen carefully. As the Grahams return home from the funeral, you can hear unseen occupants scurrying for cover. Draw my insult. I'm actually kind of impressed that you noticed that, Barry. Yeah, well, it's an important detail, because it shows us that the Grahams are having money issues, and they've clearly been listing their spare rooms on Airbnb. God, I hate you, Barry. You can see somebody's breath pluming outside here as they wait for Peter to offer them a hellacious bong rip. Then who do you think you are, anyway? In fact... Throughout the movie, you can hear these assholes jabbering away while the Grams are trying to mourn their various losses. To make matters worse, they've been leaving their filthy hippie footprints all over the flooring. Now, let's examine the Graham household individually. Charlie, the youngest, is also the coolest. She's not interested in any lame-ass book learning, and she's got a devil-may-care attitude because her big dream is to get a visual arts scholarship, move to Austin, Texas, and muck it up with iron and wine and all the other unwashed indie rockers. Dude, she just snipped off the head of a dead bird and crafted it into an action figure. There is clearly something wrong with her. Ah, don't be such a Karen. <laughs> Who among us didn't craft a few toys from dead animals when they were kids? It's just a phase. Like doing whippets at the skating rink or selling your uncle's insulin so you can buy tickets to see Mr. Mister. And Charlie, it turns out, was always Grandma Graham's favorite. You know you were her favorite, right? Even when you were a little baby, she wouldn't let me feed you because she needed to feed you. So what is satiny supposed to mean? Yeah, it's probably Charlie's favorite indie band. Yeah, and I guess Zaza's is another indie band? Yeah, probably. What, what do I look like, Black Magic Wikipedia? You look like you're not allowed within 500 feet of a public school. Okay, I walked right into that one. Anyway, next we've got Peter, who likes to smoke weed and stare at the asses of Mormon girls. I mean, there's not a whole lot else to say. As for Annie, the mom, she's played to masterful effect by the extraordinary Tony Collette. Just like Charlie, Annie's got a penchant for arts and crafts, most of which focus on the subject of her now-dead mother. And she didn't have an easy life. She had DID, which became extreme at the end, and dementia. I didn't let her anywhere near me when I had my first, my son which is why I gave her my daughter, who she immediately stabbed her hooks into. Clearly, the miniatures indicate an attempt to assert control over uncontrollable circumstances. Never thought we'd have to take the time to censor the exposed nipple of a diorama grandma. What a life it is. So apparently, Grandma Graham had a soft spot for occult rituals, and by giving suck to Charlie, she set the course for the Graham family's downfall. Yeah, that shit's bright. Mm -hmm. You'll see the following symbol appear throughout the film to mark the grandma's influence on the lives of the surviving Grams. This mark is also related to the demon god, Paimon. As for Annie, like all decent moms, she insists on being up front with her kids. I never wanted to be your mother. Bro, how are you not disturbed by this? By what? You mean the old I didn't want to have you speech? Who among us hasn't been told at some point in our lives that we were an unwanted pregnancy? My mother used to give the exact same speech every time I had a birthday. It wasn't my fault. I tried to stop it. I tried to have a miscarriage. 
She came within a gnat's ass of setting her kids on fire after dousing them with paint thinner. You got a who among us for that one? Sounds like someone lived a sheltered life. And so finally we've got Steve Graham, played by Gabriel Byrne. So just to be clear, we've got a story with hints of demonic possession, and we've got an actor who literally played a guy possessed by Satan in 1999's the End of Days. <laughs> Gee, I wonder which member of the Graham family might be behind all the demonry and witchcraft. I like the shirt. Screw you, man. Hey, kid. Yeah, but it's not Gabriel Byrne's character. He's actually the most grounded character in the whole... Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. And I'm saying it's a missed opportunity. Instead of horrifying us with his cruel, relentless charisma, Gabriel Byrne is relegated to playing the frowny dad. He's gone from sexy Satan to schlubby psychiatrist. Yeah, so now that we've- Ad break. Time to get paid. Well, today's episode is endorsed by, uh, you guessed it, folks. It's the Poor House Meal Delivery Service. I say endorsed because they're not actually paying us money, but they did send along some of their meal kits, along with some coupons for e-cigarettes. I don't quite understand the connection, but, uh... Bro, shut the hell up and tell them about the meals. You have any idea how tired I am of trying to find a new sponsor every time? Okay, folks. We here at Bankrupt Barry realize that most of you aren't exactly gainfully employed, but somehow you also can't find time to cook a wholesome meal. That's where Poor House Meal Delivery Service comes in. Unlike those snobby meal delivery services, Poor House knows that our viewers are the sort of people who prefer to pour ketchup over their dollar store steaks rather than paying for some snooty cedar plank salmon or duck a la range. Now, each Poor House meal comes direct from, uh, the, well, let's just say overseas. And compared to Hello Fresh or Blue Apron, bleh, I mean, forget it. With Poor House, you're paying pennies on the dollar. Like I said, these babies are coming from overseas, and most of them feature high-protein bait fish. So don't be surprised if they're a little gamey when they finally show up to your door. But my parole officer agrees that it's still no worse than eating at Arby's. As long as you like crackers. Yeah, most of these meals are cracker-based. Oh, and they're also loaded with caffeine to help you stay up till 3 a.m. playing Fortnite or whatever. Poorhouse accepts e-checks, all forms of crypto. Hell, you can send them some rolled up pennies if you want to. The promo code is HYPERTENSION! Game on! And now that you've met the main players, let's explore the plot structure of Hereditary, which, much like my life, works as a kind of descending staircase of sadness and misfortune. We start with Grandma's death. And the next major event is Annie insisting that Peter takes Charlie along with him to a bomb-ass Mormon-style party. Immediately, Peter ditches Charlie and heads to the back room to get torn plumb out of the frame with Mormon Girl. Meanwhile, these little shit-asses get their kicks by logging into 4chan and watching beheading videos. Eh, to be fair, it's a pretty funny beheading. As you'll see in the next scene, this movie shows extreme prejudice against the human skull and the idea of people having them. Despite being partially inhabited by the demon god Payman, Charlie has but one point of vulnerability. F***ing tree nuts! Peter tries rushing her to the hospital, but hilarity and hijinks ensue. <laughs> yeah, we can't really show you the true aftermath because it would give YouTube's graphic content detectors a case of the vapors. But just remember what I said earlier about the film's stance on skulls and the idea of them remaining attached to people's bodies. Oh, wow. Nice work, Ellis. You really captured the gravity of the scene. I'm so glad we got you out of rehab so you could grace us with your stellar editing skills. On the bright side, Charlie's headless torso gets treated to a spectacular Utah-style funeral. Hey, ain't that basic?
basically David Lynch's opening shot from Blue Velvet. You know, the one where the suburban dad has a heart attack right there on his overwatered lawn, and the camera pans down to show that there's an entire underworld of disturbing insect commerce that most of you sheeple don't even recognize. Yes, yes, thank you for raising insect awareness, Jane Goodall. In the throes of her despair, Annie befriends this creepy Joan woman, who'll come into play later. Oh, God, I feel very silly. I'm Joan. Hi. I, I, are you doing better? What? Additionally, Annie's miniatures start to take on a more sinister edge. Jesus Christ, Annie. Later, Annie pays a visit to Joan's apartment, where she identifies a number of disturbing connections between her mother and Joan. Uh, you're welcome, Matt. Oh, oh it's kind of cute, huh? Yeah, my mother used to embroider ones just like that. Did she really? Isn't that funny? Yeah, not to mention the fact that Joan washes dishes like old people f Look at this crap that Annie finds in the bottom of her mug. Yeah, the herb was deliberate, you f***ing walrus. Joan's trying to give Annie some of her homeopathic roofies. And soon after, Annie runs into Joan yet again at the craft store, where she implores Annie to let her clear out a few thetans. Hi. Oh. <laughs> Annie. Hi. <laughs> Hi. That's not Mormonism, dumbass. You're thinking of Scientology. Pay attention to the fact that Joan's got a chalkboard in the back of her Subaru. That'll be relevant to the next scene in which Joan claims her deceased grandson is writing her messages from the beyond on his favorite chalkboard that she just shoplifted from Hobby Lobby. That stinking chalkboard's the most far-fetched part of this movie. What kid plays with a chalkboard in 2018? At least make it an iPad. Well, another county heard from. Thanks for participating, yes, wife. But Annie is balls deep into witchery by now, so she hosts a seance for the entire Graham family. Hello? Mom? 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 I don't like this. Dad, I don't like this. Afterward, Annie returns to Joan's place to request a refund, but some clever camera work reveals the truth. Old Joan's just using Annie to get closer to her hot, hot Peter. Oh, Mommy. 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 Baby wants to f***. God damn it, Ellis! That's another clip from Blue Velvet. We're not paying you a case of Michelob Ultra every f***ing month for this kind of shoddy craftsmanship. Anyway, Joan is so obsessed with Peter Peter Plumpkin Eater that she shows up to his school to serenade him like some kind of Latter-day Saints version of John Cusack. Saturday! Dagony! Paragon! Woo! Get you some, Peter. Joan's trying to f All of which prompts little orphan Annie to investigate her mother's past a little more closely. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in Marwin Call. Now, I promised I wouldn't get too deep into the weeds with the whole payment thing. But what you need to know is that Annie's mom spent several years plotting out Peter as the demon god payment's personal John Malkovich. But do our idiot viewers know about being John Malkovich? Is the Charlie Kaufman stuff too obscure for them? Yeah, I don't know, bro. Pretty sure they're gonna roast you for criticizing Tarantino. Well, I only roasted his acting abilities, even though his movies tend to be overrated. Ah, whatever. The point is, Payman demands a male body, and it's implied that he's been biding his time by at least partially occupying young Charlie. 
Damon himself gets very little screen time since he's more spirit than substance, but we do get the occasional glimpse. Hey, these aren't my rules. As I said earlier, the plot structure functions as a kind of descending staircase of tragedy. First, the Graham family is weakened by the death of Grandma Graham. Then we have the death of Charlie. Then Annie allows for another point of vulnerability when she holds the family seance, which seems to open the door for the spirit of Payman, not Charlie, to begin taking greater influence over the Grahams. In order to inhabit Peter, Payman will need his vessel to take on a weakened state. And the film establishes Peter's compromised state in very subtle fashion. <laughs> Can we see that again? Oh, get serious. I'm trying to run a respectable show here. While Peter is indulging in self-abuse, Annie sneaks up into the attic for the kind of revelation we probably can't show you. Thanks to YouTube reenacting the Hayes Code. You know, the Hayes Code. Look it up, ass wipes. Oh, hold up, hold up. Pause. There it is. There's my cameo. Woo, I look smooth as hell. Well, Jesus nipple twist in Christ, how could I forget your stunning cameo? What an accomplishment. All three of our subscribers will be lining up in the parking lot to give you a blue job. Oh, no, that's fine. Go on and be a salty bitch. <laughs> I think you forgot about your cameo in the next scene. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, the gist is that Annie's dead, headless mother has somehow taken up residence in the attic. And at this point, Gabriel Byrne has had enough and turns his frowny dad shtick up to 11. And then there's more is. Oh, you mean more than your mother's headless body? Of course there is. <laughs> but Annie manages to talk steady Steve into one more occult foray. She tosses Charlie's sketchbook into the fireplace, but Payman's not too happy with this idea. <laughs> Meanwhile, Annie, whose defenses have been compromised by Joan, snaps to attention like fucking Zool. <laughs> Peter wakes to a dad who's been cooked to perfection, only to discover that. Oh, here it comes, Barry. know why we had to censor that thing. Looks like the world's smallest champagne cork. Starved myself for months to get that body. Meanwhile, Annie has developed an obsession with parkour. <laughs> Peter makes it into the attic just in time for Annie to develop late onset CTE. A few moments later, Annie reappears at the ceiling of the attic, where she takes part in yet another violent act that we can't show you. Yeah, Annie banishes her head from her own body, just like the Golden Corral banished Barry from their buffet that time he took his pants off. Yeah, yeah, but that wasn't a sexual thing. I just figured I could house a few more plates of deep-fried ham if I had more room to stretch. So, much like Father Damien from The Exorcist, Peter has had enough of this heathen bullshit, so he chooses the only reasonable option, defenestration. Oh! And as all the other big brain YouTubers have pointed out, it's this weakened state that allows the spirit of payment to slide into Peter's proverbial DMs. It turns out that all the various weirdos we've been encountering throughout the movie have all been secret participants in Grandma Graham's payment cult. Grandma Graham has emerged victorious. And that's it. We have completed the descending staircase that constitutes this film's structure. It's a movie that wisely eschews cheap-ass jump scares. In a fashion that's somewhat similar to season one of True Detective, we've got a fairly fresh and compelling storyline that involves the dark arts. 
Hey, why are you so shifty, bro? You got the runs again from eating poorhouse dinners? Well, we're nearing the end of the review, and I know you're plotting some kind of cruel scheme to light me on fire or blast me into space or something. I'm not trying to kill you. In fact, I went ahead and booked you an ayahuasca experience. I think it'll help you take stock of what led you to become such an abject loser. Ayahuasca? Well, I mean, that's actually very thoughtful. Anything you want to tell the viewers before we bounce? Yes, you're all terrible, terrible people. Place looks like shit. Goddamn fly. Well, I dig them fish nets. Where do you get them things? Ah, shit ass. Whoa, 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 ass wipe. I said smaller, not bigger. Jump in line. Left two three, right two three. Get it right, Ernie. 